a story, and it's a story of a hypothesis, and a hypothesis that, that was born in Baltimore uh, at, at the Latrobe Homes, interestingly enough, if you know the Latrobe Homes on Madison Street, just a, about a mile or two from here, and uh, it's a hypothesis that ended up uh, bringing me to Hopkins. Uh, it's the story about a book, and here you see the cover of the book. Uh, this is a book that will be released in September by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And it's a story about an emerging agenda that is now um, under the direction of uh, Andy, my colleague Andy Cherlin, uh, encompassing seven researchers across three Hopkins schools. And I was interviewing uh, one young mother, Ashley, 19 years old, in the Latrobe homes on a very hot summer day. And the first thing I noticed, of course, is there was no furniture in the house except a, a, a table with only three legs sort of propped against the wall, a lone chair and a trash-picked couch and a, and a single mattress on the floor with a filthy uh, Bugs Bunny uh, fitted sheet on it. Uh, the second thing I noticed is that there was no food in the house. So, you know, my mental calculator, uh, the family budget calculator started going. And the third thing I noticed is that Ashley, who had given birth three weeks earlier, uh, looked uh, out of it. You know, there was something wrong with her. She wasn't supporting her baby's head properly. Uh, she was visibly depressed. And so after the interview, I said, you know, <laughs> I'm worried about this mom, right? I have IRB reporting requirements. I said, you know, we actually need to, to talk to you again. Can we come back tomorrow? And of course, I, you know, I gave her the $50 and our research team came back the next day. And what I had learned in the course of talking to Ashley the prior day is there was no source of income coming into this house. Uh, they had a housing subsidy, no one worked, uh, no one got SNAP, uh, and she'd run out of the Enfamil that they'd given her when she left the hospital. And so, um, uh, you know, I was expecting to see her in the same dire straits the, the next day that I had the previous day. And instead, she met me at the door with her hair, you know, she'd gone out and gotten a perm, uh, with her hair done, she'd gone down to the Goodwill on Broadway and gotten a new pantsuit, and she was on her way to a job interview. But it occurred to me that perhaps, even though we had judged welfare reform as success because so many people had left the roles, perhaps an entirely new class of poor folks had arisen under our very noses that we hadn't even noticed. In fact, a group so poor that we didn't study them because we just assumed they, hadn't, they didn't exist. So what we decided to do in the aftermath of this first inquiry is to launch two new lines of inquiry, one qualitative and one quantitative. We would go out into a number of communities in the United States, sort of a la Michael Harrington, find people living under $2 per person per day, households with children, and we would hang out with them, follow them, look at the texture of their lives over, uh, over several months or even years' time. So in the new results from the SIP, what we find is that uh, an astonishingly large, in my view, uh, number of American children experience a spell of at least three months in extreme poverty over a given year. The figure is between 3.2 and 3.3 million children. You may say, gee, is that number big or small? Consider this. Uh, given the billions of dollars we spend on the earned income tax credit every year, we only rescue 3.2 million children from poverty. So while social policy is lifting 3.2 million children out of, policy, out of poverty through tax credits, uh, 3.2 million children are living for at least three months in a calendar year under the threshold of $2 per person per day. So like the rest of low-income children, most of the extreme poor, most of the $2 a day poor live in a household where someone worked over the course of a year. Only a small proportion have been dependent on TANF, even a little. SNAP is incredibly important, but it doesn't do enough. Only half of people in extreme poverty even get any money from the, from the SNAP system. 
Uh, and it, the, the next point is probably the most important thing I'll say, the change in household employment status, the perils of low-wage work, the, deg the de degraded nature of our low-wage labor market, uh, a, a spell in the labor market is a strong predictor of, a tr of, of entering a spell of $2 a day poverty. And of course, we see the elevated rates of hardship. And um, what we found is that while in some cases it is a true shelter from the storm, a safety net from a sea of risk, uh, which was the case with Paul Heckwilder, who, uh, who he, had a, he and his sons own a family a pizza business that failed in the recession, and all, t uh, all of his children and grandchildren went broke at once along with him, and they all ended up 22 people in his little, uh, you know, his little rickety house in, in the west side of Cleveland. Uh, so in that case, you know, tough times. Uh, his granddaughter looks back on their, their time in extreme poverty, uh, Shauna, and she said, Grandpa, it was like pioneer days. You know, she remembers, uh, she remembers all of the extreme uh, measures they went to to try to get by on life on less than $2 a day while, while li living badly doubled, tripled, quadrupled up in this tiny home in West Cleveland. Um, uh, so, but oftentimes what we find is that uh, doubling up with family uh, exposes you to a sea of risks, maybe in particular your children, and uh, oftentimes it is the experience of doubling up that actually deepens and extends and sometimes even uh, propels families into a spell of extreme poverty. Uh, we have an innovative hypothesis to test. Is extreme poverty something distinctive, especially with regard to health, health care access, and well-being of children, adolescents, and their parents? We're proposing pilot research activities in Baltimore and in Somerset County uh, on the Eastern Shore, one of the poorest rural counties in Maryland. Uh, we're gonna explore further the survey data in the SIP. Uh, the SIP has actually got matched data, matched income data and so on, and we're gonna look more at the, at the dynamics of spells. Uh, and in an innovative exercise that's gonna be mounted by Robert Moffat, uh, we're going to see how extreme poverty looks when we actually add in the value of health benefits. So far, the supplementary poverty measure has not done this, but we have a unique data source, the MAPS, that will allow us uh, to look at the overall level of resources from the government in this in-kind uh, arena that the, that the extreme poor in the United States may be enjoying that may be unavailable to the extreme poor in the rest of the world.